As your next will hear, Barfield versus New York Health and Hospitals Corporation. Please step to the podium. Your Honours, uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, just a good morning, Mr. Dorosad. I represent uh, Plaintiff Appellate Cross Appellate Anita Barfield. Just a quick procedural note. Uh, we prevailed in the District Court over the lead appeal because we filed a notice of appeal first. Uh, that be so, I'd like to reserve five minutes of my time to rebut the opposition. Um, Your Honours, this well, morning... Well, look, I mean... It... We want to hear one argument and another argument, and then if there's any, you, you, if you like, you can take three minutes for rebuttal, but uh, otherwise it's just going to be impossibly choppy. So That's fine, Judge. take seven minutes, and then we'll hear you after it. Thank you, Judge. Um, Your Honor, in requesting five minute court briefs, this court phrased the question as whether temporary workers, nurses, aides, and nurses provided to a hospital by an agency are jointly employed by the agency in the hospital. I joined the United States Department of Labor on behalf of Ms. Barfield as well as the American Nurses Association in answering that question in the affirmative. I believe, as we've stated in our brief, that the hospital was the joint employer of uh, Ms. Barfield even though she was provided to them through an agency. Uh, there are numerous reasons for that, Judge, but if you look at the, to rule otherwise, you would have to adopt the position of the defendant, which I maintain has no backing in the law whatsoever. The defendant, as the Department, the, as the Department of Labor points out, would have you abandon the standard you adopted in Zen and adopt a corporate deal piercing standard. In other words, they want the plaintiff to show, before she can recover overtime, that the defendant was engaged in a sham or a fraud to violate the requirements, the overtime requirements of the FLSA. This has never been the case in the 70 year history of the statute. Now, if you look at the reply brief of the defendant, where my views and their views collide, there are some concessions made by the defendant. The defendant, in fact, admits, on uh, I think it's uh, page 11, the defendant, in fact, admits that the standard cannot be willfulness. But the defendant says somehow you still need to prove this sham or this fraud to show a joint employment relationship. Well, employee status or employment status is a prerequisite or not necessarily an element but a condition precedent to bring a claim for overtime. And if you have to prove a willful violation of the overtime laws in order to show an employment uh, relationship, then you are in effect requiring the plaintiff to prove a willful violation of the overtime laws. So uh, let me go to what you are appealing, which I take it was a reduction of uh, the, um, the attorney's fees. Why isn't it appropriate to view this as I think at least implicitly Judge Rakoff viewed it as a case in which after all you were not really all that interested in the two thousand dollars of overtime that was not given and which you got or even the two thousand dollars of liquidated damages which were given whether they were given under the mandatory or under the uh, the, the uh, optional part of that, but that what you really were interested in was a class action. And that you lost. So even though you spent 63 hours, and in effect you were docked 142 hours from the uh, total amount, why wasn't this a judgment by a uh, district court with great experience that basically the class action was worth at least half of what was going on, not in terms of hours, but in terms of importance. Well, I, I would agree with you that Judge Rakoff is a judge of great experience and, and wisdom, and he should be informed on the joint employment issue. <laughs> um, on the fees issue, Judge, I am of the opinion that um, I contemplated 
for whom it needed a motion to reconsider. Because I believe that Judge Rakoff probably did not realize that the time spent between July and November of 2005 uh, was, that's the, that's the time that was related in that it benefited both the class motion and the judge. To that, to that extent, isn't that exactly right, though, but then that is an appropriate, would have been an appropriate basis uh, for a motion to reconsider, uh, but that we on, on appeal with the limits before us should say this judge looked at the thing uh, we have no way of saying that he didn't know what was it right before him. And the result that he reached is one which we might reach or might not reach, but is not an implausible one based on the relative importance of the two facts. Well, Your Honor, I think this court has consistently held that, that the, the ultimate objective in any fee analysis is not to overcompensate and not to overcompensate. In other words, if you expend 63 hours on a, a losing motion, uh, you shouldn't be docked for 144. Likewise, if you spend um, 63 hours on a winning case, you shouldn't be paid 150 hours. Um, and I think this court has always held that there must be some rational relationship between the reduction and the time actually well, spent surely, what, what, on the losing what, what, what I'm taking from what the judge did is that is that uh, not only the time spent on the motion was unproductive, but the uh, the the magnitude of the effort generally was driven by the uh, the hope and expectation that it would be a class action, and uh, of course settlement values uh, also matter. I mean, if it's a matter of $2,000, uh, health and hospitals might very well not have expended what they expended on the other side. If people don't beat their heads against the wall. Um, let me address the, the interest issue, Your Honor, because uh, he's talking about my interest and the plaintiff's interest, so I can tell you what those interests were. Um, we didn't appeal the class action um, ruling, even though we felt there were some errors of law, because it wasn't really, uh, in terms of interest, that that uh, above the interests of the plaintiff herself. Remember, when we lose a class action certification, we're not losing the claim. The plaintiff still has a claim. The plaintiff can get some correct. So your argument, your argument is that what really mattered was establishing. Uh, that the Rutherford factors as applied by Zhang applied in this case uh, bring about this result and that this is what matters to the parties because that will become an important precedent for the other cases. Yeah. And that therefore the class, the getting of a class action uh, may even have been a mistake to have asked for it in the first place and to spend 63 hours doing it. <laughs> It, it, it probably may have or may not have, but in, 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 in terms of, um, as I said, we believe that the class action, the, the judge, for example, uh, assumed a different standard which was later corrected in, when, uh, at the early time he decided the class motion. I would not appeal it because in terms of the plaintiff, our interests were not going to be served by any appeal. By the time you appeal, the limitations period runs, so it's not stated. FLSA case on after Rule 23 class action. Uh, so that that rather really tells you that it, it, this was not it's such a great interest of the plaintiff. Now, whenever you bring a case, uh, you, there are times when bringing a class action may have collateral benefits for the individual plaintiff. And I believe in this case it would have if you have other people come forward to join her. Right. So that's not a, that's not a benefit necessarily to the plaintiff. The establishment of the principle might have helped other people and to the extent you were counsel of record they might have thought that it would be beneficial to you know retain you that's down the road but that it wouldn't have had a benefit for the plaintiff beyond these damages and her subsequent employment with the hospital right absolutely your honor and that comes back to the, the, the fee standard in itself i think the way i understand it uh, from reading all these cases is that you should be dark fees if you lose a claim not a motion and getting back to the wider point of the benefit to, to a similar situated people as a whole uh i want to the district court i don't know with uh, great success or not but probably not but the that just this ruling on the joint employment issue will automatically benefit all those who are similarly situated to the plaintiff.
plaintiff, Ms. Balfi. You've given a lot of people external benefits. <laughs> you are done in many cases. Thank you. Uh, uh, you, thank you, you you've reserved uh, three minutes for rebuttal, so thank we'll you. hear the other side. once it was clear to the um, plaintiff that it wasn't a class action? I believe that they, they certainly could have raised the issue on appeal. They could have asked the court to no, reconsider. No, no, but I'm sorry if I'm not being clear. Once the court told the plaintiff that there would not be a class action, why is it that hours expended after that are intertwined with a class action that now isn't going forward anymore? We believe, based on the record before the court, uh, and apparently Judge Rakoff did too, that there was still a lot of discovery driven towards the concept of whether a class claim might be appropriate, whether the plaintiff would ask the court to revisit it down the road or would file at the end of discovery. Did Judge Rakoff, in his ruling, say that these extra hours that he docked, the difference between 63 and 142, which is a lot, uh, were driven by the possibility that in a motion for reconsideration there might be class action? Did he, he find said that any? He, he believed that they were intertwined with each other. And also to remember, the court uh, did, reduce the <laughs> low, did reduce hours worked under the low star first part of the analysis. But what Judge Rakoff really did was go to the success of the litigation. Yeah, and, and that's where the 50% reduction came. It's just an equivalent of 140 odd uh, hours. I mean, Success in litigation has to do with how much time it was spent. I mean, uh, doesn't it? Well, if the success in litigation has to do with what the litigation's purpose and intent was at the outset and how much of that was attained. And incidentally, Even when that was not done, if after that the bulk of the hours which, for which he didn't give credit were, were spent? Well, indeed, it wasn't a question of not giving credit for hours, but rather taking the list and reducing it by 50% because of this, the sense that there was such a limited success. And I will point out... What, what does that mean, a limited success? In terms of what he spent his time on after the class action was denied he was totally successful. Uh, I, I respectfully disagree. For example, the complaint said that the plaintiff worked 88 hours uh, per week, which equates to 48 hours of overtime per week. At the end of the day, uh, she received $888 uh, of overtime pay, uh, which was then liquidated. Um, so that's not even equivalent to one week's worth of what was initially alleged. Um, it's not remotely close well, to what did, she claimed even personally. At what did, did Judge Rakoff diminish the damages because of lack of success in the individual overtime case or did he do it entirely on the basis of the uh, class action uh, lack of success. Judge Rakoff, as I understand it, did it based on his view that the litigation as a whole was unsuccessful, and that's what the language in this case law points to. It does not say based on a particular claim or cause of action asserted, but the litigation as a whole, and I believe that's where his focus was. Um, I, I believe that more fundamentally the reason that the attorney's fee award is inappropriate is because judgment never should have been entered uh, for the plaintiff in the first place. Um, we believe that the district court error in finding uh, that there were material factual issues not in dispute um, as related to the, the specifically delineated factors under Zen, uh, but perhaps uh, more importantly, also applying the circuit's law and finding that the Health and Hospitals Corporation uh, was a joint employer with the referral agencies. And on either of those two grounds, uh, we believe that the, this court should overturn the district court's uh, decision. So you want a jury trial on this? Well, we believe, in fact, that the, that the uh, the facts below, the undisputed facts, point to the conclusion that the economic realities show that HHC is not a joint employer. Well, let, this, me, ask you, uh, let, let me ask you this. I mean, HHC uh, was the only uh, was the only hospital employer of this 
of Ms. Barfield, correct? That's the only particular place that she has gone. Although this is a question of whether this is a sham arrangement between... I'm not sure. I mean, if you have a question of alter ego, then you often, almost always have a sham issue. But wouldn't you agree that you can have joint employers entirely on the up and up? I would agree that you could on the up and up, but under the circumstances... So if you could have it on the up and up, then why can't you have it here on the up and up? Why does it have to be a fraud? Well, what they're looking to is whether this is an effort to... If the case law is saying what the language says over and over and over, it's looking to what the economic realities are. Is this a sham? And what are the economic realities here that this woman was working regularly on account of the agency and on account of the hospital, solely for the hospital? And that was... She could have been working anywhere. She could have, but she wasn't. She could have been working anywhere else. She could have been working on the high seas under a charter, but she wasn't. She was working here. I certainly can't speak to charters, but I can speak to that this court said this was manifestly not intended to bring normal, strategically oriented contractual schemes within the ambit of the FLSA. The record makes 100% clear that this is a normal, strategically oriented contractual scheme. This agency, Medical Staffing Network, for example... By the sole place where she worked. I mean, this is the sole place where she worked. And to that extent, it's hard to understand your argument that Bellevue is not the employer. A co-employer. A co-employer, I'm sorry. Even the Zen court has said that that is only one of the many tests. But Jen was dealing, of course, with a specific situation and clarifying that certainly courts would look to see if they dealt with... If they were confronted with a sham relationship. As the Chief pointed out to you, we may not be concerned here with whether it's a sham. It's whether or not under a broadly written statutory definition, your client qualifies as an employer. And I believe, Your Honor, that what the test in Zen calls for is the courts look at all the factors that are relevant to the circumstances. Well, great. So now let's... Why don't you talk about what fact there is that could lead a jury to think that some place like this was not her joint employer? For example, the rules that apply in Bellevue is that every time before the plaintiff or any other temp worker could come to work, that they would first need to try to offer the shift to an on-staff nurse or certified nurse's aide on overtime, in fact, under the FLSA or under the... See, I understand why that helps you show that it wasn't a sham because if anybody had said yes, you would have given them the work and they would have been paid overtime. So I understand why you think that shows you're not a sham, acting in good faith. But when they say no and the person you go to is someone who's already worked 39 and a half hours, I'm not sure why you don't think you're a joint employer and have overtime responsibilities to that individual, too. Because, again, they have a direct employer who has overtime responsibilities. In fact, when she put in properly, instead of trying to do an end run around the rules, she did get paid time and a half by the other agencies. So this isn't an effort to not pay her overtime or not pay anyone overtime. But she worked overtime and she worked overtime at Bellevue and she regularly worked overtime at Bellevue. Now, whether there was any sham or anything else, isn't this precisely what the FLSA, whether I like it or not, is designed to cover? This isn't a complicated new form of outsourcing to other countries or things which Zhang understandably left open for situations which we don't know about. But isn't this a run-of-the-mind thing that the FLSA was designed to say, if you work overtime, you get overtime pay? First of all, there was only time that she worked $883 worth of overtime in the many years that she worked through these temporary agencies. So it's hardly a regular occurrence, even under the damages request that the plaintiffs made. That, again, just goes to your bona fides. It doesn't really have anything to do with whether you have to pay the overtime. You see, the more you can argue that all of this shows that there's no sham and there's no subterfuge, and this does support that. On the other hand, the more you say we offer the overtime to this employee, that we offer the overtime to that employee, and only when those two turned out we offered 
What? We offered the overtime to Ms. Barfield. And she took it. And that, that would suggest that the economic reality is that she was, as it were, next in line to work overtime. But I think one of the distinct differences, we don't offer it to Ms. Barfield, we offer it to the staffing agency. Ms. Barfield herself will go for months at a time to Guyana uh, to be with her family. Well, and that goes, you turn it down anytime. Well, that, that goes to the question of your record keeping. And I don't want to minimize how significant this is. You, This lady came to work for you through at least three or four different agencies and apparently you're not set up or your record keeping is not set up to keep track of the fact that when the fourth agency sends her to you that's her 42nd hour of work that week but I'm not sure that's our concern under the statute um, as to whether you're going to have to keep your records differently well, I believe you're right, that what, what it really comes down to at the end of the day is did the economic reality picture, was it completely reviewed by the court below? Did the court look at all the factors or did it all apply? Would it make a difference in looking at this if she'd come to you from just one agency? I don't believe it would have made any difference. So even if the one same one. agency sent her to you for the 41st and 42nd hour, your view is you're not obliged to pay for it. But that would be pay the overtime the for it. Obligation. At most, the argument that you've made <coughs> would seem to go to the liquidated damages, would seem to go to the question of whether uh, when you had no reason to know, you should in any way be penalized. Now, the FLSA is very strict on that. It is not a uh, we penalize people only if they've been negligent or other things. But at most it goes to that. It doesn't go to the issue of whether there was overtime that has to be paid, doesn't it? Well, yeah, we certainly did say that it goes to the willfulness argument. We agree. She actually went against policy by signing in through multiple but of course, but even, uh, even if there is no particular reason, the district court may order liquidated damages. One of the problems about the, that section is that that is entirely in uh, the discretion of, uh, uh, of the district court, regardless of any uh, of the reason for the mistake, isn't it, under the statute? Well, I, I believe it's the, 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 the good discretion of the court, so long as the factual record somewhat supports it. Uh, yeah. It can't be certainly out of whole cloth, and the factual record doesn't support in any way anything other than HHC's efforts at compliance with the FLSA. So I do believe it was it was erroneous in, in this case. But also, I recognize my, my time is uh, running somewhat short, but... <laughs> We do have also here that the court, even applying the strict factors in Zhang, found as undisputed facts that were, in fact, in dispute. Um, for example, the claim uh, by Ms. Barfield, uh, her own testimony that she was not supervised, that uh, she was given a patient, and that she was not uh, given any discipline, she was not given direction. She let was let me ask you this. You're not, really, you're not really suggesting to us that your nursing assistants at Bellevue Hospital are unsupervised, are you? Uh, well, the nursing assistants employed, absolutely not. Somebody who comes no, no, are you suggesting, work? just so that your patients understand this, <laughs> that contract nursing assistants are unsupervised by anybody at Bellevue Hospital? I mean, counsel, you know, I think you have some colorable arguments here, but that didn't strike me as close to the top of the list. Well, uh, Your Honor, I believe that there's something very different about the level of supervision required to comply with medical mandates and I, I'd be very safety. careful about... Uh, uh, about what you say here, which is a matter of public record, and might then come back to haunt you in a malpractice suit, which has a lot more at stake in it than this uh, suit has. I, I certainly believe that all the patients are perfectly uh, well taken care of, and all prove us, so prove of a supervision, sure prove a supervision of contract nurses. So, well, there, I believe here the level of supervision and the type of responsibilities that Ms. Barfield in particular had, uh, which are very different than some of the acute care nurses and, and things of that nature. Uh, it was a very minimal level of supervision required for uh, compliance with the law. I'd really let it go, to counsel. <laughs> I, I, I have a more practical question for you, given the effect of this ruling on your client. Um, the federal statute requires you to pay overtime to your employees, not to contract agencies. How, how are you dealing with this situation? I mean, when, how are you dealing with this now? You're not required to pay time and a half to the um, agency that just happens to be fourth in line. How are you dealing with this, well, this the agency, ruling? The, com the contractual relationship between the agencies and HHC has always provided that it's the agency's responsibility. No, no, but now that you have an adverse ruling in this case, 
how are you paying overtime to people, or are you just making them sign sign statements that they haven't worked over 40 hours? How are you dealing with this? Again, it's, we, we believe that it's a contractual obligation of the agencies to cover it, and we, they must certify to us that they are in compliance with the well, how, suppose, the direct employer. Suppose, suppose a particular nurse or nurse's assistant works for three agencies, and those each of those agencies send that nurse and nurse's assistant to two different hospitals. Now, how can, how can, how can any of the agencies uh, uh, be aware of who's working overtime and who isn't? Well, the, agency, the agencies keep track of their employees. Of their, each agency, the, the proper statement is each agency keeps track of that agency's employees. Agency A is not keeping track of agencies B of agency B's employees, which could be the very same nurse and nurse's assistant. I, I think that all goes right to the point that these are not joint employers, and that the fact that that's basically impossible for the but I understood hundreds of these agencies to keep no, track. Why, 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 does it, why does it go to that? Why does it go to that? Why doesn't it go to the fact that they are both joint employers uh, with Bellevue? And that then it is Bellevue's, uh, why doesn't that argument cut against you of saying that's precisely why, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, they want the hospital to be responsible so that people who are doing overtime get paid overtime. And that then it becomes your responsibility to ask the nurse, if you have worked overtime, has, if you pay the agencies, have the agencies paid you? If not, we will take away from the agencies the next time and give you the money. Why doesn't that uh, just say, if in effect, it's you who are in control? Because there are so many other agencies. Well, there are so many agencies, there are also so many hospitals. But I understood Judge Rakoff's opinion to be limited to the fact that her, her employment was all at Bellevue. I didn't even understand him to hold as a matter of law that you would be a joint employer if she worked at four or six yes. of the HHC hospitals. It's that it was all at Bellevue. Yeah, I agree, Your Honor, and that's what but I was that, saying to, no. to the Chief Judge's question. I think if there that's are sort of, dozens of yeah. hospitals where she could work, it really would actually be impossible to keep track if she showed up at a clinic one day in the Bronx. And that's sort of why it's uh, bewildering that we've had years of litigation over this with, you know, with hundreds of thousands of dollars of of, of expenses at least run up, where the where the the amount of money is <coughs> picayune, and as far as ho health and hospitals is concerned, uh, the only time this would e would would uh, would uh, affect your interest would be when there is a single person who works more than forty hours for a single hospital owned by. Health and Hospitals Corporation, and that should be easy enough. I mean, if you don't keep track now, it should be easy enough to keep track. It's the same name. Well, again, there was a policy against exactly what she did, so apparently the systems can be uh, circumvented uh, with enough effort. Uh, so I think that's where the well, you, know, you, know, you didn't ask the nurses to sign a statement when they when they started work that this was not that they had not surpassed forty hours at Bellevue Hospital yet that week. No, it was, it was slightly different, Your Honor. It was that they're not signing through more than one agency because that way we find Right, well, yeah, you've got a system that doesn't doesn't uh, capture what you need to capture. Why don't you ask them to sign in? Why do you ask them to assure that they're not signing in through more than one agency? We did, Your Honor, ask them. Well, why do you ask them to do that? Which of us is making sure that, that ours works for Isn't you? that an earthly, oh, indirect yes. way of, of getting at something which yeah. you can ask quite easily? Have you worked more than 40 hours at Bellevue? But uh, if presumably the reason you ask each nurse and nurse assistant to certify that they're only working for one agency is to assure that they either don't work overtime or that you don't accrue the overtime expense. Isn't that correct? Well, yeah, I can't speak to it because I didn't draft the policy, but I can say there are, there are all kinds of laws about the number of hours worked uh, by medical personnel. I see what you're saying. So that it, um, it, it, it's a compiler in the air. And a, a truck driver. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
So it comes with quick forms as to the allegations against my client working, in effect, allegedly unauthorized hours. Practically, how do you expect the hospital to satisfy this? I mean, they're paying the employment agency, and they're not required to pay time and a half to the employment agency. Well, Your Honor, do you know they were actually paying time and a half of overtime hours up until a few years ago? And their testimony was this time. But that's not what the law requires. The law requires that they pay the employee time and a half. So would they just have to work this out in their contracts with the employment agency? They very well could, Your Honor, and many employers do that. But getting back to how would they know, there is a level of knowledge here that is seldom seen in overtime cases. The employer, the defendant, set the hours in a schedule. They call it a tentative plan. I call it a schedule of how many hours would be worked for the week. The plaintiff is then required to call the hospital, which she did before every shift, to get approval for the hours. Then when she went to the hospital, she was assigned to a certain job. After the shift was over, the hours were not only recorded and approved, but her job was evaluated and approved. And then those hours were then checked by another person to verify that they were okay. And then when the invoice came in, they verified the hours for a full time. So there was a level of knowledge here. I don't understand how they can claim they don't have knowledge where the four different, every hour she worked was approved four different times. Now, on the issue of... Now, you would concede, would you not concede that the relief you have won in this case can be implemented practically, in practical terms, only where the nurse or nurse's assistant works more than 40 hours for a single hospital? It would be easiest in that sense. It would be easiest? Yes. How would it be practical in any other way? If you work for one agency for 20 hours at Hilltop Hospital and you work for 19 hours for another agency at Hillside Hospital, and then a third agency sends the nurse to work at Bellevue for 20 hours, how is Bellevue or anyone going to know? And which one should pay the overtime? That's true, Your Honor. Technically, if they all meet the requirements of the suffer and permit language, you could bring it. But as a practical matter... In any event, that is not this suit. No way would I... That's not this case. It was too confusing and too difficult to prove. I wouldn't take it. So the concept of the... That may not be the legal standard, although I think it's very wise from a business point of view. But in terms of the legal standard, all that the district court held and all you're asking us to affirm is that where you have the same person working more than 40 hours for the same hospital, that that hospital is a joint employer for the purpose of paying the overtime. Yes, Your Honor. Those are the facts of this case. If the court wants to limit the ruling to this case, we're free to... Well, we always just decide our cases. Heaven forfend that we should write broadly about all sorts of things. But let me ask you, in your class action, were all the people that you were attempting to join in the class action all people who had spent all their time with one hospital? No, Your Honor. I'm glad you raised that question because it relates back to Chief Jacob's question about why the hospital was not limiting people to one agency. Well, there's a secret in this case. The hospital itself was what they call recycling, recycling the union employees through agencies for overtime. No, I don't think you heard my question. I said, were the people in class action all people who had worked for one hospital? I didn't ask about the number of agencies. I asked about whether they were all for Bellevue. They were all Bellevue employees? And only Bellevue employees? No, not Bellevue. They were all HHC employees. Oh, different hospitals for HHC. But at least you were trying to treat the group as one hospital, HHC. 
Yes, Your Honor. Yeah, okay. Okay. And just one quick note on the um, uh, attorney fee issue. Um, it, it is my understanding that the, the circuit has never addressed the issue of the standard for reduction of fees on a motion as opposed to a claim, at least not directly. Uh, so maybe that's a legal... Um, but your your the decision of the judge that you're challenging is his decision that your class action theory was intertwined even with the claim. Right? Oh, no, that, that's an interesting thing, Your Honor. The part that was intertwined was the 63 hours. After November 17th, nothing ever was done on the class action. Well, I'm not, uh, let me pursue that for, you, for a moment. Was your theory, as you pursued the plaintiff's claim, this larger theory you've just given us that um, any, any, um, person sent by an agency to any HHC hospital was entitled to overtime once they worked more than 40 hours. After the motion was decided, we did not do any discovery or any type of litigation as to anyone else. The court, there's a line in this order that says this case shall proceed as individually as to the plaintiff only. And all the discovery, and the defendant has as many as eight lawyers, they would not have let me go forward beyond that. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, now, opposing counsel said but that even in this case, you won less than you were seeking in terms of number of hours. Is that correct? That is absolutely not so. In the complaint, I generally, when I write the complaint, I usually allege um, whatever overtime they, they think it is entitled to. Because at that point, I don't know how many hours of overtime. I know that she is entitled to overtime. When the court directed us to submit the damages, and we did, we were awarded every dollar of damages we saw. Well, where is this claim that she was working as much as 88 hours a week? Uh, did, I mean, I did see that in the papers. How did that surface? Uh, there was one allegation in the complaint that as in some weeks, and, and, and there was a week in which she said she worked as many as 88 hours. In fact, she said that that week, I think there was a snowstorm or something. We actually gave her a bed to work double or triple shifts uh, and with some sleep in between. But you say that whatever you said in the complaint, when when the question came in, how many overtime hours did she work, you asked for a certain number and the court awarded you that number. And what stage of the litigation were you, did you make that request? Uh, after the judgment on liability and summary judgment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. We'll reserve decision.